I'm Andy Rich, and I'm the Dean of the Colin Powell School here at the City College of New York. And I want to welcome you to this memorial service for our colleague, Gabrielle Haslip Vieira. For those of you who are visitors to CCNY, I welcome you to our campus. We are so pleased to have members of Gabe's family with us today, along with his friends and his colleagues and some former students. We know of many others who wanted to join us, but we're glad that we have this group together today, particularly on such a rainy day. I've been Dean of the Colum Powell School for five years. The Colum Powell School is the home of the social sciences and Gabe was a part of our faculty. He retired before I took on this role, so I didn't have the privilege of really knowing him well at all. But I was at City College earlier in my career and I had the opportunity to cross paths with him just a few times then. This was back in the early 2000s and I was a young assistant professor in political science. He was just one hallway uh, away from me, but I was somebody who was a little nervous and kind of anxious and um, mostly thought that I should cut a pretty wide swath around uh, senior faculty. That was, you know, kind of how I thought about it then. Maybe sometimes I still feel that way. Um, but my memory of him was his smile and a kind of twinkle in his eye when he spoke to me and just a couple of times and, and about his kindness. I remember kindness and encouragement he wanted to make sure that I knew about this college and its history. And I remember him as someone who made me and I believe others who were young faculty feel welcome here. He didn't have to do that. We were not in the same department and he had the kind of record of distinction as a scholar that could intimidate a new professor. But he did and I'm grateful for that. For many years, Gabe was chair of the Department of Sociology here at City College. Going back to the 1980s, he was the chair of the former Department of Latin American and Hispanic Caribbean Studies. He directed the Center for Puerto Rican Studies at Hunter College, and he was a renowned specialist in the social history of colonial Mexico and the evolution of Latino communities in New York City. Many of you knew him in these various capacities, and as a mentor and as a friend, there were many people who would have liked to have been here today but could not, and among them is the chancellor of the City University of New York, Felix Matos Rodriguez, who was mentored by Gabe when he was a young scholar. And when we shared the news of his passing, the chancellor wrote back with sadness that Gabe was a friend who helped put him into the field when he first started as an adjunct at City College while getting his PhD at Columbia. Today's service has been planned by Professor Sherry Baver, one of Gabe's closest friends on the faculty and a member of the faculty in political science and in Latin American and Latino studies, and by Professor Rosalia Reyes-Simon, also a close friend from our Department of Classical and Modern Languages and Literature. And my thanks to both of you for planning this. I also want to acknowledge Daniel Fila, who has organized the logistics for today. My thanks again for all of you for being here. We have a number of folks who will speak, and they'll just go one to the next. And it's my pleasure to introduce the first, and that's the president of City College, Vince Boudreau. Some of you may by now be sick of me saying this because I managed to work it into almost every time I get to a mic, but I came to City College in 1991, so over three decades. And Gay was one of the first people I met. And back in those days, and really until quite recently, we had a pretty well populated faculty and staff dining room, which we will have again. Um, and that meant that I probably had more lunches with Gabe than any other member of the faculty uh, over those, those first 10 or 15 years. He was almost always there, almost always interested in spending you know, a good amount of time at your table. He was, um, in the very best way possible, conspiratorial. <laughs> he would, the, 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 the grin that Andy talked about was, was a grin he would, he would give you when, he was, when, when the other people had left the table. And he wanted to tell you what he thought was really going on. <laughs> and sometimes he was right. And you know, he wasn't always right. But he carried with him the history of this institution as a student, as a, as a mentor, as a professor, as someone who had seen good days and bad days, had, 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 had been here during some of the darkest times of, of, of financial hardship. 
So he's committed to this place. He was committed to its history, to its students, to his colleagues. Um, as committed to this place and the history of this place and the legacy as he was to his academic subject matter. I think in his mind they were the same thing. I think he was here because so many of his people were here. And so many of the people that cared about the things he wrote about were also here. He, as Andy said, he was uh, for years the chair of the Department of Sociology. And I think I had a, a hand in twisting his arm to accept that position. It wasn't a position he wanted. It wasn't a position that I think in any real fundamental way made him happy. Maybe you can relate. Um, but he did it out of service. And he did it, I think, at a moment when his wisdom and his stewardship of a faculty were sorely needed. In a very real way, he held that department together for years and years and years. Um, and I don't think if you asked him if he was fundamentally a sociologist, if he would have said he was fundamentally a sociologist. Right? He was, as Andy said, as he, he was more of a historian. And so for decades and decades, his knowledge, his attention, his care benefited generations and generations of, of students, but also younger faculty, colleagues, and people like me who tried to work alongside him to make this institution a, a little bit of a better place. Um, I think it was me who signed his retirement papers. And I will tell you, that was a very sad day. There are people who are institutions in a place like this who you can count on being there for years and years. You can count on telling you what this place stands for, and what it should stand for. And Gabe was one of those people. So I missed him when he retired. I will miss him now. And to his family, let me say, and you know this because one of the things I learned is almost all of them studied under Gabe. <laughs> he was tremendously important to this institution. And, and we will all miss him very much. So thank you. Okay. I have to move the microphone down, down a lot. Um, I too want to welcome everybody here. Um, this is a celebration of our very good friend and relative in some cases, Gabe. <clears throat> Before I go on and say what I want to say, I do want to thank uh, my colleague Rosalia over there, Reyes Simon of the Classical Languages. It's got a very long name now, uh, literature, Spanish, blah, 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 uh, who helped me with this event. And also Daniel Hila is, is wonderful. Uh, the Colin Powell School shines because of Daniel and his uh, event organizing skills. Um, um, Daniel is very good because he can take the very vague idea of pro, you know, professors, oh, we're going to have a memorial and actually coordinate it into a meaningful celebration. And that is very, very useful. So Rosalia and I decided that I should say a few words on how we picked the people to speak today. And we thought that since this memorial is intended primarily in his workplace, we would find other people in his workplace who could talk about uh, Gabriel as a teacher, a mentor, a scholar, as an administrator. You have heard uh, the things that he has done here already as an administrator and university-wide. He was the head of the Centro for uh, three years. Um, and so that was very important. Um, it, since Gabe retired a while back, it was hard to find young students who had studied him, uh, had studied with him, but he was a mentor, certainly to, um, he's not here, so I could say, little, little fellow, who uh, we're very proud of him, who became our chancellor. But I remember, too, when he was 
a very young adjunct in our department, and I won't even tell you the stories, but he was hilariously funny, very resourceful, and I knew he would go places. <laughs> I didn't quite know he'd become our chancellor. Um, <clears throat> but um, I thought that I could talk about Gabriel in a way as, as my mentor, a little younger than uh, he was, and I came to the City College. I knew I had studied Latin America, Latin American politics, but I knew virtually nothing about the Latino community of New York City. I'm happy that he was my mentor because now, as the New York Times reported yesterday, one third of New York City is la Latino, although my students now correct me all the time and say, please say Latinx, and I'm trying, I'm a little old, but Latinx. Um, but he was, he was really uh, a mentor to me. Uh, he ta taught me about the history, the social structure, the wide diversity of New York City's Latino community, and we did two edited volumes together, but you will meet um, some of the diversity uh, in this room this afternoon, people who contributed to our uh, book who, who represent other parts of New York's Latino. Um, so in terms of the speakers, he um, was close to, and I think maybe was also a mentor to Professor Ramona Hernandez, who is here today, director of our Dominican Studies uh, Institute. She will speak about that. Um, as sociology chair, Gabriel also worked with uh, my longtime colleague, uh, Iris Lopez, who couldn't be here today, but our other colleague, uh, our newer, younger colleague, Norma Fuentes Mayorga, will read what Iris has written and may also say, give us some of her own words. Um, and then both Professor Lopez and Professor Fuentes Mayorga said, oh, you must have Laura Bowman as one of the speakers. So Laura um, not only serves as someone who helps lost sociology students and professors, um, but in her spare time, uh, she has another life as a poet, a children's book author, and we're very, very proud of her. And she has written something for Gabe today. And, and she was a good friend of Gabe. She's all, she's all around buena gente, as we would say. She's, she's good folks. Uh, two of our next speakers are Ed Morales and Javier Castaño, who were both contributors to the second edition of our book. Both are New York City journalists, um, and they will tell you about their uh, relationship with Gabriel. Um, Carmen Molina Tamacas is a Salvadoran journalist. She couldn't be here today, but she sent her remarks to Professor uh, Reis Simon, and um, she regards Gabe as a, as a Sal Salvadoreña, a Salvadoran woman. She regards Gabe as a mentor, and that was very uh, impressive. And then our final speaker is a journalist, Walker Simer, Simon, uh, whom I suspect, I actually know because I did a little interviewing here in the last half hour, probably knew Gabe longer than uh, anybody else in this room. And Walker will tell us uh, how he met him, but I think it was when Gabe was doing his dissertation research in, in Mexico many, many, many decades. Uh, ago. So he's going to leave us with some final words about our dear friend. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Um, I hope I can finish when I read uh, this uh, with something that it's not here. Ah, hablar aquí, ¿verdad? Me escucha ahora, ¿sí? Um, if I had time, I might share something that uh, I should have put in here too, but I didn't have the, uh, uh, the time since I'm going through uh, so many things and uh, when he passed. Uh, 
But in any event, let me see, let me see if I can do that and not take too much time of, of yours. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for coming to this. This is, um, I will do everything as possible not to cry. Um, I am glad that I see members uh, of the old guards, people who had, who joined uh, Gabriel uh, in the struggle for ethnic studies, for Puerto Rican studies, and then for Dominican studies. Toti from Lehman College, an old uh, friend, is here. Gracia, you know, you came out of retirement to be here with us. Elizabeth Starcevich, uh, que le puedo decir, you know, thank you. And one of our own from the Dominican Studies Institute, Anthony Stevens, who's also retired and all that kind of thing. Uh, gracias, uh, you know, for coming to share with us this, this, this moment that is so important. So let me read what I, what I uh, wrote that day. There are no words that can convey the sadness we feel upon receiving the news of Gabriel's passing. Gabriel was a true supporter of CUNY DSI. His backing came in our early years when we needed it the most. When CUNY DSI was established at City College of New York, Gabriel lent his voice in support. He held faith in the vision of its founders who were so full of dreams and hopes at a time when their community, which was the then beginning to grow teeth, find its way and give birth and rise uh, to leaders. Like many Puerto Rican before him, uh, he became an ally of Dominicans and his, and his support invigorated and fortified them. A man with a cause and a man of great conviction. He was held in high esteem by many at CCMY. He held leverage and, in this case, as in others, was willing to share it with a young yet promising entity that was CUNY DSI. Gabriel was part of a cadre of people in CCMY and CUNY who had opposed CUNY's decisions to increase tuition and to dismantle Puerto Rican black and women's studies uh, departments, among other changes that increasingly transformed CUNY into an institution that many believe, believed uh, was distancing itself from its original mission. When I joined as director of CUNY DSI, as well as associate professor in the Department of Sociology, Gabriel opened the door uh, for me in the department. Then a niche of people who shared Gabriel's political views with regards to CUNY and who were, for the most part, engaged scholars with a commitment to social causes. It was not difficult for these colleagues to see the Dominican Studies Institute as a revolutionary entity that represented a counter movement to CUNY's direction at the time. I am personally grateful to Gabriel because during his tenure as chair of the Department of Sociology, he furthered his support for CUNY DSI. He made me feel welcome and valued. He took every opportunity to let the new colleagues who came to replace the old ones who had retired or had passed, uh, to know that the institute added tremendous value to the department, indeed. Gabriel took joy in our accomplishments and contributed meaningfully to my own development as a scholar. I became uh, promoted to full professor during his uh, chairship. My biggest regret is that I did not have a chance to thank, to thank him for what he did for us and especially for me. My consolation is to know that he grew and sustained a close friendship with members of CUNY DSI, a relationship that started with Gabriel mentoring both Nelson Santana, now Associate Professor of Library Sciences at Bronx Community College, and Jensen Ortiz, today librarian at CUNY DSI. Jesse Perez, CUNY DSI archivist, 
a mentee, uh, a mentee of Don Idilio. Then, uh, uh, at that moment, uh, he was the archivist at the Dominican Studies Institute and also uh, retired and joined this uh, group of people, of young people that Javier uh, Gabriel uh, was uh, mentoring uh, uh, at the moment and became regular member of this small uh, circle of Gabriel's uh, CUNY DSI friends you know, that he created at the Institute. That friendship and camaraderie went on after Gabriel retired and became ill. Gabriel and his CUNY DSI friends used to share a cup of coffee at CCNY's Rotonda on sunny and warm afternoons. Gabriel touched many lives, students who took his classes, professors who secured tenure, or promotion under his leadership, whether in the Puerto Rican Studies Department before it was dismantled, or later in the Sociology Department when, when he assumed his leadership. His physical presence would be miss, missed uh, terribly. His legacy at CUNY, uh, DSI, however, will be cherished and shared as one Puerto Rican who, as I know to be true, indeed, open the doors for other people or Latino ancestry to come in. And I'm gonna end by saying something personal that I don't think uh, many people know. Uh, and I, uh, uh, Cherry, uh, thank you for reminding me of this. Um, the first uh, Latino studies, uh, Latinos in New York book uh, that you published uh, in Gabriel, we have a chapter, we have a chapter there. I wrote a chapter with uh, Silvio Torres Ayand. And as far as I know, maybe seven or eight years ago, I uh, learned that that was the piece that was read the most in academia uh, of, of, you know, that I have written. Now the other stuff that I have done. But that piece went everywhere and continued to be read everywhere, even though we have replaced that with a new one, that became a foundation uh, in, in the perception uh, and the view that is today prevalent, and that is that it is a Latino family, and it's very large, but it's also very diverse, uh, and that diversity matters, and that is in that book. Muchas gracias. Thank you, good afternoon. What an honor to be with the president and my dean and every senior professor that I uh, admire in this university, including you, Professora Weber. <laughs> Thank you, I don't have anything particular. I joined City College in 2014 when Professor Has Hasley Piera was already retired, but I was lucky to see right next to him and to share moments, just having coffee and having his mentorship at a very relaxed time in his life, and to inherit some of his paintings that he left us to take care of. <laughs> I, um, Professor Weber asked me a few times if I wanted to speak at this event, and I didn't think I was deserving of it, because I didn't know him as well as others. And then uh, Professor Lopez asked me, because she cannot attend today, a senior colleague of Professor um, Hasley Vieira, if I could read her words. So that's what I'm doing here. I have a poem that I found, and I'd love to read it but at another occasion because they told me I have five minutes. But anyway, Professor Lopez says, she's a senior professor here in Latin American and Latino studies, as well as in sociology. And she knows Professor Hasley Vieira for over 30 years or so. So I'm reading her words. She says, I'm sorry I could not be here in person today, but I'm still recovering from my medical issues. I wish to thank Professor Sherry Weber for inviting me to say a few words, and Professor Norma Fuentes for reading my short speech. It is with sadness that I reflect upon my long-term friendship with Gabriel Hasley Vieira. As we study and plan our careers, the last thing we are prepared for is to say goodbye to our dear colleagues and friends. I knew Gay for almost 40 years. I was hired in the Latin American and Caribbean studies when I was, when it, I'm sorry, when it was a department. At the same time, the faculty consisted of Sherry Baver, 
Jose Rizari, Adriana Garcia, and myself. Gabe always appeared younger than he was. I remember that once. At a department meeting, his age came up, and one of our colleagues, Adriana, chided him about selling his soul to the devil for his youthful looks. It was not until years later that I realized that Gabe was 12 years my senior. Gabe was the colleague who told me I was granted tenure. I remember he was so excited that he walked into my classroom when I was in session to share the news with me. He witnessed my promotions and other academic adventures and journeys. For example, in 1990, we had a long discussion about my being recruited for UCLA for a visiting professorship. In the 20 years of my tenure at City College, part of my career, we had a wonderful cadre of colleagues at City College. Elizabeth Stars, Vic, Susan Bessie, Gerardo Renique, Ramona Hernandez, Sherry Weber, who still are active in our program and others. We collaborated academically and fought for social justice with our students. We developed a collective consciousness as we worked together to build the Latin American and Latino Studies Department at City College. Unlike most Puerto Ricans of the generation, Gabe grew up in Long Island. He was proud of his family background and accomplishments. His father was an administrator and his brother, Jimmy Haslip, a nationally recognized jazz musician. He often talked about his family and kept photos of them in his office. He was a good son and throughout the years shared many stories of his mother and aunt. Like me, Gabe received his PhD at Columbia University. He was a graphic artist before he became a historian. As a historian, he specialized in Mexico, but also did research in Puerto Rican history and the history of other parts of the Spanish-speaking Caribbean. He was active and well-published in his field, as we all know. When City College President Yolanda Moses demoted the last department to a program, my academic line and Gabe's were removed to the sociology department, as our president explained. In time, Gabe chaired the sociology department for eight years. He was an efficient and meticulous chair, and he hired most of the current generation of scholars teaching in the sociology department. He convinced me to consider chairing the sociology department, which I did from 2012 to 2015. One of Gabe's claims to fame was being the interim director of the Center of the Puerto Rican Studies, as we heard before. I remember how he beamed with pride when he told me in the student cafeteria that he had been invited to fill that position. Like everything he did, he put his heart and soul into directing the Centro. We are proud of him and his myriad accomplishments. Gabe was a good guy. He was strong-willed, some might say stubborn at times, but always ready to work with students, colleagues, and the community. One of his goals was to improve the plight of Hispanics in the United States and all people. At the end of his career at City College, he was active as always, but started to show a little gray. He fought valiantly against blood cancer and left us too soon. He is missed. May he rest in power. Those are the words of Ivis Lopez. As has been said by some others who have been at the podium, there are those who would have liked to have been here but cannot. In that regard, I'm going to share some of the memories um, that former professors and adjuncts had sent to me, and then I will conclude with remarks from myself. So this first one is from Professor Barbara Levy-Simon, who was um, an adjunct for many years um, doing research and fieldwork. And um, 
She's a professor emeritus from um, Columbia University. For precisely 25 years, as an adjunct associate professor of sociology at CCNY, I had the joy of chatting with Dr. Haslip Vieira in the hallway, in the room with the Xerox machine. I never expected to have had conversations with full-time faculties and departmental leaders because, of course, they were always busy and I was not part of the department meetings or formal social networks. Nonetheless, he and I often shared comments about teaching, New York City dynamics, national politics, and baseball in between Xeroxing tasks and running to classes. He was a jewel of a human being. Best wishes, Barbara Levy Simon. This is from um, Professor Chen, current professor at City, unable to attend. Professor Haslip Vieira was not only an accomplished historian, but also a personable colleague who shared lively accounts of his days as a practicing artist in the military service, his travels aboard, abroad, and his children growing up amongst the farms, his childhood growing up amongst the farms of Long Island. His influential presence and intellectual contributions have laid the groundwork for future generations of leaders, scholars, and instructors who embody the full diversity of our interconnected society. Sincerely, Professor Catherine Chen, Sociology Department. This is from a former adjunct who is now an associate professor at um, Hunter College, Calvin Smiley. My memories of Professor Haslip Vieira are fond, as he was always pleasant to engage with while I taught at City and encouraging to my doctoral studies. Calvin Smiley. And this final one is from Reuben J. Thomas, a former associate professor at sociology who is now at the University of New Mexico. When I was in, when I was new to City College, new to the city and new to being a professor, Gabe was kind and helpful to me as I know he was to so many over his career. He was generous with his time, wonderful to chat with, intellectually broad, and he was a living encyclopedia of institutional knowledge. I was very lucky to have had him as a friend and a mentor at that time in my life, and I will never forget him. I know I am not alone with that. And this is from me. In 2006, I was reassigned to the sociology department as a punishment for overstepping the boundaries of an office assistant. I had the audacity to assist students with advisement, even though I had been trained and allowed to do so before the arrival of a new director. But the reassignment backfired because Dr. Has Dr. Gabriel Haslick Vieira was the chair of the sociology department, and he became my knight in shining armor. He took off my shackles and allowed me to be free, in addition to yearly lobbying for me to get a raise. <laughs> you see, Haslip Vieira was a champion of the underdog. 
He was a man, you know, I had this, ah, I can see better. Ah, big. You see, Haslip Vieta was a champion of the underdog. He was a man devoid of ego and did not see himself above others, no matter what their station in life. His introduction to my duties and responsibilities was as effortless as floating on water. And once he became aware that his new office assistant was not dumber than dirt <laughs> with regards to advisement, he openly allowed me to assist students. I was floating on air. Having been trained by Charlene Darbacy in the dean's office and tutored by Dr. Moran and Ms. Ferre of the advisement division, ah, assisting students was all I ever wanted to do. Gabe allowed me to step out of my box because he was a champion of people and causes. He was not loud and braggadocious, fighter for justice, but you best believe he carried a big stick. He quietly burned the midnight oil, gathered his statistical weaponry, contacted his allies, and used impeccable reasoning to wear down and win over the opposition. Within a seven year period, he hired eight new assistant professors, in some cases, three at a time. Thus, Professor Biles, Chen, Doric, Levinson, Paik, Lewis McCoy, Poros, and Thomas became the foundation of the sociology department and the MA division. Working with Professor Haslett Vieira was joyous because of his strong work ethics, his bright smile, <laughs> his easy laugh, and empathy for other human beings. He will be missed in the world of academics and missed by his family and his friends. Thus, it is my prayer that he whisper in our ears when wisdom we need to hear and judgment and speech needs to be tempered with patience and respect so we do not neglect our hum humanness. Yes, he will be missed. His laughter we can no longer hear. His face we can no longer see. But he will live on in our memories. So, in the words of boys to men, I will take with me my memories to be my sunshine after the rain. Cause it's so hard to say goodbye to yesterday. Adios, Kate. Hi, I um, just want to express uh, again feeling honored to be asked to speak here at Gabe's Memorial and thanks again to Sherry and Rosalia for inviting me. Um, my relationship with Gabe was um, more collegial than personal, but I had many personal moments with him. He uh, would show up at parties that the Latino academic mafia would throw. 
New York, and <clears throat> and it kind of was very important to me because you know I, most of my career has been as a journalist, but at these social gatherings, um, I was embraced by uh, members of the academy, and ultimately, I've now become someone that um, is an instructor at various universities here in New York. So, um, you know, if you take a look at this photo here, it really says everything you need to know about Gabe. You know, he's this, this seriousness, he has this seriousness, and I, I personally really, uh, I'm drawn to serious people, but at the same time, um, you can see that his face is about to break into a warm and generous smile. Um, and that's what really Gabe meant to me. Um, I met Gabe mostly through Juan Flores and Angela Falcone, who are two very important people in my life. Um, and, uh, you know, that was how I got invited to submit a chapter to this uh, book. And the really important thing um, about, one of the things that uh, Gabe really instilled in me was his Afro-Latino identity and the importance of um, really pushing that out and refusing to go along with the status quo about what it means to be Latino and not allow the Africanness in Latinos to be erased. And he was really great, greatly inspiring to me on that um, level. And, uh, you know, uh, one of the last times that um, I, was, first of all, I forgot to mention that he was a really great dresser and he was so cool, like he had jazz in his blood, and now I know that he does really have jazz in his blood. Um, but one of the last times I spoke with him was uh, when Angelo passed away um, about four or five years ago, and I was in a Mexican restaurant. And um, I got uh, these texts, and then I called Gabe. And, you know, I was starting to feel like this small moment of anxiety about this generation of people who pioneered um, the instruction and, and the development of departments for uh, the study of uh, the ethnicity and racial uh, identity of Latinos in New York. And, um, you know, Angelo was always warning everybody that his health wasn't very good, but it was still a great shock. So speaking to um, Gabe at that moment um, gave me a lot of calm and, you know, understanding how to move forward. And, uh, you know, so now, you know, we're at this moment where, you know, uh, Angelo passed away, and then Juan passed away, uh, and also Juan's wife, Miriam, who was so important in developing um, Afro-Latino awareness. And uh, so, so, you know, I, I don't want to be too sad about Gabe's passing, because, you know, maybe his gift was really helping us all move on and uh, remember what they accomplished and carry it, you know, in our hearts. Thanks. Uh, my name is Javier Castaño. Um, I'm a journalist, and thank you for inviting me to talk today. Uh, I did not prepare anything like you guys. I just wrote some notes in, on my way here on the 7E and then the number one. <laughs> but like, it's kind of easy to talk about him. Um, I am an immigrant, and an immigrant from Colombia. And as immigrant, I really value the people who open doors for me. And Gabriel did that for me. Uh, I came here um, without knowing English and also the city, but I started working at El Diario La Prensa as a general assignment reporter. And at that time, I met uh, Angelo Falcon and another friend, um, Howard Jordan, and many other uh, Puerto Rican leaders. 
even some politicians. And um, I remember I used to call uh, Angelo and Howard for quotes. And in many occasions that I uh, met um, Gabriel in parties and also in events and even here in this uh, institution, um, he always welcomed me. He opened up. He always opened doors for me, and he was always smiling. Uh, he's a very humble person, and um, it's easy to love him. Let's say. Um, and in one of those meetings, he invited me to write a chapter in the Latinos in New York, the first one in 2010, and then uh, again in 2020. And I remember uh, him calling me and saying that how extraordinary was my piece about comparing the Ecuadorians and Colombian immigrants coming to the city of New York and nobody, nobody has done it before and all that. That was the kind of guy. And I admire him and I respect him and I honor, honor him because he opened many doors for me. So our relationship with, uh, with uh, Gabriel is a really New Yorker story. It's between two immigrants or two Latinos, one from Puerto Rico and Colombia. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, thank you, Sherry, for inviting me and uh, to be able to organize this event, this memorial. I met, um, my name is Rosalia Reyes. Uh, I'm a professor here at City College. Uh, and when I moved to New York in 2012, uh, Gabe was one of the first person that I met, and he was very welcoming. Uh, my English, uh, was uh, <laughs> worse than today. <laughs> uh, my, I always say that my English is a work in progress, but he's, he told me once, uh, don't be afraid to speak in English, just speak. You are a Latina, you are from Mexico, you are an immigrant. And as, um, as, an, as a journalist, he, I, I was invited to, to co-author one chapter in the book Latinos in New York, and I remember that he he was a, a great mentor, uh, and only not not only for me but for uh, any person uh, who who went to to ask for his advice. He was very generous, um, and I I feel very uh, honored to to become a friend of him. So that's why I really appreciate that when he passed away, um, and now mm, working here as a full-time professor in, at the Department of um, uh, Language and Literature, uh, I feel like I need to, to share uh, something for him, uh, because I feel very grateful. So that's why, um, uh, we were inviting uh, the different colleagues from Puerto Rico, uh, uh, from Colombia, Ecuador, and one of them was Carmen. Carmen uh, is a journalist too. Uh, she is from um, uh, Salvador, and she uh, couldn't come today. Uh, that's why he, she, she sent me a, a short message um, just to to share uh, uh, today with you. So just let me uh, read it. Um, sorry This happens sometimes, sorry. Okay. Okay, good afternoon. I am very 
honor to be included in this ceremony, honoring the memory of the former chair of the Department of Sociology at City College, Professor Gabriel Haslet Vieira. Uh, when I moved from El Salvador to New York back in 2011, I started reporting about the Salvadorian immigrants in the city. There was, in general, an absence of documentation about Central American immigration. In my lonely research efforts, I came across the essay, The Evolution of the Latino Community, from Professor Hasley Piera, included in the book, Hispanic New York, edited by Claudio Remeseira. The essay was the key that opened the door to the past, showing the first data available from Salvadorian immigrants before the Civil War, triggered the mass exile in the late 70s and the 80s. The essay, among other documents, was the corner store of my research that chronicles 100 years of Salvadorian immigration in, the, in New York, in the book Salvi Yorkers. Through an email from Dr. Ramona Hernandez, director of the CUNY Dominican Studies Institute, I learned of Professor Haslick Vieira passing. I did not have the pleasure of meeting him in person. As Dr. Hernandez said, quoting, what I regret most is not having had the opportunity to thank him for what he did for us and especially for me. Every time I, I meet young Salvadorians or students looking for information, I make sure to highlight the legacy of scholars like Professor Hasli Viera, because what is, our, what is our purpose if not preserving the memory of our communities? Carmen Molina Tamacas, journalist. Thank you. A lot of speakers have spoken about uh, various aspects of Gabriel in memorializing him. However, his life was so multifaceted that I'd like to add a few more touches to, uh, so we can picture him and recreate him uh, in, as the broad and uh, interesting person that he was. Um, he can de be described in many ways original, uh, unconventional, erudite, and a, a seeker of veracity, even um, going against uh, received wisdom and academic trends that are in vogue. Um, in terms of originality, I think he took a very different route to academia so that perhaps, since he didn't go straight from high school to college, um, provided maybe a broader canvas on which he could put the context. Uh, as was mentioned, he was a graphic artist, but he really was a, an artist for, for years, uh, commuted from Long Island to New York as a, to work in advertising. Then he was drafted and uh, put in a unit where, um, his art, artistic skills were put to use, and then he went to City College, um, which for me always had a, um, a revered place because my father was a refugee from Nazi Germany and uh, kicked out of school when he was 15 uh, for being Jewish and coming here with City College opening its arms so he could get a great education as a chemical engineer. Um, what um, drew him to Latin American history was the Mexican muralists, um, something which I was raised, again, through my father um, to admire uh, when we uh, went from the city we lived in, Monterey, to Mexico City many times. So I met him in 1974, it was the summer, uh, being in college, I didn't I just flew to Mexico City because I wanted to learn more about film in the summer, and then I didn't know where to stay. I walked on the main avenue, Consular Reform, and there's some people from Monterey on a bench. They said, oh, stay at our crazy, crazy, crazy boarding house. 
So I went there, <laughs> walked up, uh, put my stuff down, and um, there were six people who I thought were Mexican lying sideways across the bed, like uh, chatting, and I was being introduced, and then um, um, he heard me and he said, oh, you're American. And then in an outer boroughese, which showed that he wasn't an academic protection. Well, then we can forget about the, all these guys. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, he, so I was impressed um, uh, you know, by his grasp of knowledge. And then um, uh, began a friendship which lasted um, 49 years and six months. And um, I was able to see him, fortunately, three days before he died. So. Um, I didn't expect him to go, but it was a way to say goodbye. Um, his originality uh, uh, was shown in many ways. He could, um, he came up with the idea of a book on Latinos in New York before other people did. Uh, in the first edition, for example, uh, and maybe his Mexican experience had to do with this, there was an essay on Mexicans in New York, a topic which had not been explored but he knew someone at, at uh, Barnard, Richard C. Smith, who wrote the first sort of published essay in University Press on that in a more general way. And um, as was mentioned here about uh, Central America, when he asked me to contribute to the second book, you know, I had been a correspondent with Latin America, so I said I could do Peruvians, I could do Venezuelans, I could do Colombians, I could do Mexicans. And I was disappointed, he said, no, do Central Americans. There's been, as been noted, really nothing written about them as a group. So um, I started researching, and there were hardly <coughs> any newspaper articles about the Salvadorians in Long Island, but really in New York, hardly anything about anyone. And, um, but he kept encouraging me. Uh, and among other things, he put me in contact with the head of the population division, in the planning department. And um, thanks to Rosalia, who co-authored with me, we really started um, excavating from scratch. She stood in line at consulates uh, in the morning to get in to try to speak to people because they wouldn't answer. And then the other people would say, I'm not here for the normal thing. Oh, yeah, 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 you know, so stay back. Anyway, um, the he had um, a strong impulse for veracity, and he was unafraid to tackle a sensitive topic, which is race. Um, and a, the, the energetic drive he had, despite a lot of medical problems, um, was very clear um, uh, after he retired. Um, it's little known, but um, he started um, a, uh, publisher called Latino Studies Press, and in a few years' time, he um, put out six books, uh, all with art on the cover. I remember asking on the white Latino privilege, what's that image over there of that person? Oh, I took S Sammy Sosa and, you know, uh, moved it around and everything. <laughs> anyway, he, um, uh, on the one hand, um, took, uh, the, he wasn't afraid to tackle the whole question of uh, African-American trends, um, especially led by someone here who is at City College and it's in power, Leonard Jeffries, and um, point out that uh, a school of African-American thought was trying to appropriate the achievements of uh, uh, the original peoples of Latin America by saying Africans had come over the sea and were here. And in the pre-internet days, when these, that school thought that um, the African, you know, that population was really part of Egypt. He dug up um, comments from the culture minister of Egypt rejecting that. I don't know how he did it. Um, then um, he tackled head on um, different ways that uh, uh, Hispanics um, in Latin America didn't want to acknowledge um, their African-American or their African roots, or you know, just at least some of the descendants. And in one case, he 
um, try demolishing um, the ideology of the Tainos being um, much more important in the Caribbean as a source, you know, which were, they were nearly wiped out, um, as a source of, uh, as, a, as, a, as a source of genetics. And, um, and also the civilization that they were reputedly built, and he also questioned that. And then on the other hand, um, with white Latino privilege, the book, um, uh, he um, tried showing how um, in Latin America and Dominican Republic and other places, uh, the photos and statues of people showed them being much more white and erasing um, features associated with Sub-Saharan Africa. And um, <clears throat> uh, he showed how um, they tried um, also going back to Indian background to sort of uh, erase that. And then he had another approach in looking at Puerto Rico and other places where uh, his Hispanomania to show that the culture really in the, in the um, Spanish-speaking Caribbean was really Hispanic, had nothing to do with other sources like the African heritage. Um, at the same time, some, a lot of these people who work on topics like these um, are, are focused, as they should be, on their area, but his erudition was vast. Um, his grasp of history um, through the world was astounding. At one time, when we met for brunch, I was just curious about the history of Turkey and Anatolia. And reflecting his artistic training and talent, he, he took like a napkin and he outlined the coast of Anatolia with all these coves and inlets, and then had arrows um, pointing at different groups that came from different directions. Then one time after I'd been to, well, I went to Istanbul on vacation, he had never been there, but he said, did you visit the Topaki Palace? And did you see where the harem was? And did you? <laughs> and um, uh, I said, you know, uh, they, there's so much that was constructed there. How come we don't hear about them? Or he said, oh, that's because no one knew where to put them. Is it Eastern civilization or Western civilization? Um, so now he also had it sense of picking up and seeing future trends, especially in technology. Now, being uh, in my declining years, uh, I hear from a lot of people, oh, that person, that professor, that they don't really uh, know how the, you know, the technology works, et cetera, et cetera. Well, he was the first person who started noticing how it was important to get anti-hacking software. Um, he was the first person I knew who set up um, HD television, spent days and days with text, trying it up since he wanted to see nature. Um, he was a conscious, before other people really mentioned it, how um, technology and uh, surveillance would become much bigger. In 2004, uh, during the presidential election, I really despaired Bush could be reelected because of the Patriot Act and war and this, uh, uh, searches. And he said, it doesn't matter if really Kerry wins because the whole societal trend with the technology is unstoppable and it's going to become more and more. Um, he, so in many ways, um, he was an original and um, I can't think of anyone I know who tackled things from so many different perspectives, but yet um, some people who are very innovative um, kind of disregard or do not value um, past trends. Now, just one thing just to show his, his white grasp. Uh, intersectionality is something that's um, in vogue. And in his first book, well, his thesis, um, he looked at crime in, in, um, in colonial Mexico and uh, he came up with the original perspective about mestizos, in other words, people who were both had Indian and white blood. Um, 
being much more criminally, uh, being caught for more crimes. And he said because there were less than, that, less than the Indians or the whites, because he really didn't have a, a culture where, where they felt um, a strictures. Um, but he also um, and was foreseen, and I want to call it up right here, on the question of women in colonial Mexico. So decades after um, he did his dissertation and published it, uh, there, there's a wave of books uh, looking at colonial Mexico and independent women from that era. So in one of those books, um, published in 2003, uh, in the introduction it says, um, but women being independent, said the patterns of behavior collided with the Bourbon officials' attempts to bolster the family. And then he goes, uh, jumps over. Gabriel Haslip Vera points out in a study of crime in the capital that the majority of female criminals arrested during this period were charged with prostitution and adultery. Charges were also levied against women who engaged in disputes with their husbands, maintained lovers, or, want, or engaged um, or, or um, wanted to live as libertines. Haslip Vera also states that many of these colonial female criminals had a strong sense of independence and a rebelliousness that was in total contrast to the submissive ideal promoted by educated opinion and law. Um, so yeah, while his focus was crime, it's almost like he could, and he was buried in all these documents, he could see other angles which only other people exploited later. So um, anyway, those are the few of many things I can say about him. And um, uh, as a lot of people here say, um, he'll be missed. But I think his originality um, and especially uh, his hewing to veracity and trying to tackle difficult subjects is an ideal which we can carry on for today. Thank you. Well, I guess it's up to me to thank you for being here, and I think we learned more than we, we knew Gabriel was great, but we didn't know how great and interesting uh, he was. And um, thank you for being here and remembering him uh, today, all of us together, and we have a little reception over here so we can talk to each other a little bit more. We can meet each other a little bit more, and I want to thank the college and the Colin Powell School and President Boudreau and Dean Rich for supporting this event today, and Gabe will be missed. He was an important part of City College. Thank you.